Hello everyone and welcome to our first Top Tips for Switching to Teaching Online webinar. Hopefully you can all see and uh, see my slides and hear me. There won't be too many slides today so if you're having visual problems don't worry. What we will have is a video of our two panellists. Um, if there are any questions at all and can, um, please send a comment in the question box. Um, so welcome to our, uh, the first in our series of Top Tips for Switching to Teaching Online. We'll be emailing you invites to the next webinars in the series, and you can also keep an eye out for the next webinars on our website. This link and a recording of the webinar today will be emailed to you one week after this webinar is finished, so you'll get all of this afterwards. Okay, I am Amy Sparrow. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at SAGE, and I look after our SAGE campus platform, which provides structured online learning for skills and research methods. Before we start, I'd like to run a quick poll to gauge the room. It'll appear quickly on the screen, uh, it'll appear shortly on the screen, and you can uh, Vote, vote in your box and then um, we'll click on from there. One sec. Okay, so everyone should be able to see the screen now and on the poll. Oh, I can see the answers are coming in quickly. We've got a really good turnout today. We've got over 100 people on. Um, and I'll give you a, a short minute to answer the poll and then we'll click on. Okay, wow. So I think the majority of you have voted now and we've got a leader is that 40% have taken one or more online courses for work and then 37% have taken one or more for work and pleasure. Um, we still have 22% who haven't taken anything. All right, close. And in the poll. Can everybody see my screen again, my slides? And so it was, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold for one second so I can see a couple of people have technical issues. So I'll respond there. Oh yes, thanks very much, everyone. Okay, so before I'm introducing you to our panelists today, we have the wonderful Tom Chatfield and Elspeth Timmons, who both together created our Sage Campus Critical Thinking Online course. Tom is an author, tech philosopher, and broadcaster. He was our subject matter expert on our Critical Thinking Online course, and the author here he is. Tom's screen is on now. You should be able to see him, and he is the author of the popular Sage Critical Thinking textbook. Tom is interested in improving our understanding of digital technology and its uses in policy, education, engagement. You can find out about his many, uh, many affiliations on his website. Uh, Elspeth is an uh, instructional design extraordinaire and director of Jigsaw Learning. Jigsaw Learning provides no-nonsense instructional design consultancy for distance, blended, and e-learning. Elspeth was the ID who helped build the critical thinking course with Tom. So in the webinar today, I'm going to be asking Tom and Elspeth some, quick, some key questions about switching to online learning, and they'll discuss the answers together. Throughout, please do ask questions using the chat box, which I can see everyone's used now. Thank you for that. Um, and where relevant, I'm going to ask them during the discussion. However, as more questions will come in than we can answer instantly, we've also saved 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the discussion, which I'll dedicate purely to your questions, where questions cannot be answered during the webinar. And we'll also be posting a follow-up Q&A and a recording of the webinar to you a week after, a week after this, this finishes. Okay, so before I ever hand over to Tom and Elsbeth for the questions, I'm going to run one more poll that's relevant to their chat. So, in a second... Can everyone look at the poll on the screen? Oh, I can see results are coming in now. I'll give you a minute or so to answer this, and then Tom and Elsbeth, I'll tell you these answers, and I will sh I will show you. Um, great, there we go. And then Tom and Elsbeth can use this in the discussion. So the question is: To what extent do you agree that blended or online learning can effectively replace in-person teaching? Got a really mixed bag of answers. I'll give it one more minute and then we'll kick off the chat. Okay, I think the majority of you have voted now. Okay, so it's a very split answer. We've got 36% are saying they somewhat agree, followed by 25% who are saying they somewhat disagree. 18% not sure and 14% fully agree, only 6% fully disagree. So we're, we're leaning towards the somewhat agree to agree end of the spectrum. So to kick that off, my first question to Tom and Elsbeth, if you can turn your cameras and I will stop sharing my screen now. So I believe everyone can just see Tom and Elsbeth. Can you, can, can you confirm for me, someone in the chat box that we can see Tom and Elsbeth? Yes, thank you very much, good. Okay, so I'm gonna kick, kick off to Tom and Elsbeth and the first question they're gonna be discussing is what's the relative value of online learning 
compared to in-person learning. And I'm going to mute myself now and you two unmute and take away. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, I'll start the question if that's all right, Tom. Um, from my perspective, I think that it's difficult to say that, that to look at the relative values because the design is critical. So whether you have in-person learning or online, the design, the learning design is what makes all the difference. Um, it's very easy to make generalizations based on personal experiences or experiences from school or university about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I think at the moment, there's a lot of um, debate based on anecdote and personal feeling when actually there's a lot of empirical evidence out there to say that there are benefits to both approaches and it depends completely on the context. It depends on the subject, on the objectives and on the cohort. Um, I think at the moment, clearly, online learning is extraordinarily valuable versus in person because it's simply not possible to be together. Um, so there are definite and distinct advantages at the moment. Um, but I would say, you know, it depends on the design. Yeah, and I'm sitting here nodding, and now I'm gonna I'm gonna risk doing what Elspeth tells me. I shouldn't make a attempt a few generalizations, <laughs> um, but I guess it does seem to me to be worth breaking down this apparent dichotomy. You know, it, it it in a way it's an echo of kind of online and offline as an alleged dichotomy. That really, if you want to understand how people use the internet and technology in general, you have to throw that away. And you have to start thinking about the actual behaviors and habits through which people kind of augment their daily lives with and through technology, with communication and so on. You know, it's, it's much better to think about sort of people carrying around with them an information layer that they tap into. And so, you know, one of the things about good design in the 21st century is it acknowledges this connectivity. I write critical thinking textbooks, among other things. And I'm sort of super conscious of the fact that you know, for anybody looking at my my books and trying to think critically, trying to control their own habits and time and attention to manage, you know, between social media and between news and between family and work and so on. This is one of the central struggles for them. And that applies whether they are having in-person experiences or uh, virtual experiences. Where I think there's a big difference is that the appointment structure of most in-person learning and the in-person aspects and so on, it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you in terms of concentration and focus. Now, no, bad design might still mean that the experiences aren't engaging or memorable, but a lot of structural heavy lifting is done by things such as campuses and seminars and in-person stuff and so on. And when that is absent from the informal arena of self-directed online learning, the design is you have to work twice as hard to introduce these things because fundamentally, you know, good learning tends to be about differentiation. You know, the human mind in order to learn and thrive needs different types and textures of time and attention. Technology is partly challenging because it often ends up as a kind of undifferentiated, habitual browsing and flicking a mess of distraction. So where I get excited about the opportunities of online learning, is when it's done in full knowledge of people's habits and struggles and where rather than turning its back on the internet at large and people's habits and practices and so on, it, it reaches out towards them, it connects to them. Uh, I'm sure we'll be discussing this in more detail later, but where instead of pretending that what you need to do is try and carve out a kind of virtual campus space, which is somehow, you know, cut off from the rest of the world and a little ivory tower, a little kind of ideal of learning as isolation from the world. Instead you say, well, you know, these are people who are going to be having browsers open, who are going to be able to consume short form video content, who might be doing this while while having other stuff going on in their lives. So what does it mean meaningfully to kind of exist in that context and speak to it and be in touch with it to, to set people tasks that they then act on and research on and so on? And, you know, I'd wrap it up by saying I wanted to get rid of this dichotomy. And I guess Elspeth's key point about good design, well, all good design is now digitally literate design. It doesn't mean it's delivered through a digital platform, but it's literate to the digital age we live in. And, and, and if, as we should be, you know, we're terribly concerned about trying to equip citizens, students of all types to, to be discerning consumers of information, not just to be, if you like, kind of manipulated or feel disempowered by the information environments they find themselves in, then it behoves us to think very carefully about 
cognition, critical engagement and learning in this kind of constantly blended, augmented context. I agree. And I think that one of the biggest challenges as a student is this shift of control. So that when you're in, in person or like a traditional setting, learning setting in a classroom or on a campus, your level of control over the event is much lower than it is when you're looking at asynchronous, particularly asynchronous online learning. And so as a student, you're having to deal with a whole new set of challenges. So maybe as a student, the technology is not as much of a challenge for you as it maybe is for the person who's delivering the programme. But you're trying to compete with other things that are going on around in your life. You've got the distraction of, as you were saying, multiple channels, um, ordinary life, trying to schedule around other people doing things, and also trying to think about when you can get the focus time to reflect and to properly engage in your learning activities. And so I think oftentimes you talk about the benefits being that it's flexible, that you can do it when you want, that you can repeat and review at leisure but also the challenge is finding the time and potentially the equipment and the facility to do that yeah and i'm i'm good i'm sitting here nodding which is great and i think you know one of the other changes in mindset that it can be very difficult for instructors to make is, is to move away from the idea that that what you do is in advance drawing on your knowledge and experience come up with um, a, a syllabus a kind of comprehensive uh, program and then you, you can deliver that having decided in advance uh, what what's going on because you know with digital as a sort of mindset you are allowed to go in with questions unsure about what the needs you're addressing are and understanding that those needs might evolve I think it's a very interesting challenge to say, well, okay, you can have permission to um, you can have permission to go in and ask people what they want, to go in and ask questions, to go in and not necessarily pretend that you come bearing a fully fledged syllabus complete with answers in advance. You can be exploratory alongside the people you're teaching, react to them, learn with them, and generally just just kind of open up stuff. A lot more to iteration as we as we like to say in the tech world yeah and I think that's something that's potentially unique to being to being able to deliver online um, is is the ability to personalize what you're doing much more to individual learners because you're learning from them and you're able to participate in the experience with them much more than you could if you were in a traditional lecture for example and I think also certainly um, I'm going to talk about general experiences now, Tom, you know, looking at my ch my children who've been learning online for the last um, two or three months, their relationships with their teachers have changed a lot. Um, suddenly their teachers are humans who ha who live in houses and have families and yes. who struggle with technology or don't necessarily have the answers to the questions. Um, and they feel empowered as students to be able to ask questions. They, they feel much more confident interacting than I think they, they did at, at school. Um, so I think it's a, it, there are very positive um, benefits for students and teachers of making a move to a distance online approach. But at the same time, you need to be cognizant of the challenges that your students and you are, are up against. And I yeah. think particularly at the moment, it's one thing to be delivering a well-designed, well-thought-through programme that you've had weeks or months to prepare. And it's quite another thing to have been thrown into a situation where, you know, by tomorrow, you've got to come up with a way to deliver your, your programme differently. Yeah, and I think that that's really, seems really worth emphasizing to me you know that there's there's a big difference between switching to online learning as a kind of five-year plan with lots of strategy and consultation and switching to online learning as a result of a global pandemic you know when everyone is desperately trying to get through the day they're very different things and I think an advantage of this can be that it foregrounds the kind of fallible human side 
But of course, that's a huge challenge. You know, if you're an instructor, if you're you're kind of paid, if your role is to instruct and be authoritative, to suddenly kind of learn alongside those you're teaching, but while doing your job and and keeping up and sort of you know staying on top of stuff, it's hugely challenging. It's hugely exceptional. It's not the way anyone would have planned it. And without something too trite, you know, to turn it into opportunity, I think has got to be about just taking a very active interest in people's experience of the learning that you're trying to provide and of the ways in which what they what they get out is is different from what you might wish or what you put in and, and what you can practically do. Um, it's going to be, if I'm being optimistic, you know, which can be a tough thing to do in present times, I, I like to think that that in many ways we might accidentally end up somewhere better than if this was a kind of a top-down, you know, highly strategized, locked down five-year transition program because we can take an interest in, in what works psychologically in what informal channels people find useful and also in just this kind of consultative iterative approach you know everyone has effectively been forced to launch a kind of open live beta and wing it and ultimately there's no point pretending uh, that that isn't what's happening there's no point pretending that this is all perfect and planned and you have all the answers it's just it, that doesn't doesn't really convince anybody I'm going to jump in here, Tom, and uh, this is Amy, because I think you've started answering our second question, which is really mm. great. It leads on nicely Sorry. to, no, 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 that's brilliant. Um, what do you think are the positive opportunities that online teaching brings? And I think oh, yeah, you've, got... you've started to get to this, which is great. So if you two could answer this one. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go first on this one. Um, we can kind of roughly um, alternate on these. So I have started answering this, and I guess, I mean, again, the online teaching, it, it's, you know, Inside that phrase, there's a huge blend of opportunities, and this blend is partly in itself the opportunity. You know, if I'm just trying to kind of film hour-long lectures and, and, and give them to you as a sort of replication of what I did, maybe that's good. Maybe I can deliver some great stuff, and I'm a very experienced lecturer, perhaps, and I've got some terrific kind of content. But in some ways, the opportunities are going to be around the margins of that. It's going to be, you know, sort of how attentive I'm able to be to people getting back and saying, well, I didn't understand this or me pushing out the question and saying very briefly, let me know what you didn't understand. I, I can't answer individually, but next time I can try and clarify. I can try and share a resource that explains it. I, I think I think there's a kind of letting go here by which I mean the idea that I personally should design all the resources. Should I have control over them? You know, really, that, that control is gone. I can't control. If someone doesn't understand me, they're going to go on Wikipedia, basically. I mean, that always happens in a learning situation. But as pedagogues, we're not necessarily up close and personal with that fact. But now they're blatantly going to do that if I haven't explained something in a way that reaches them. Uh, it doesn't mean that's a good thing to do, but it means that I could, for example, say, well, you know, actually don't go to Wikipedia. There's another source that's better or do go to Wikipedia, but maybe try and critique it, uh, you know, see, see what it doesn't say or edit Wikipedia yourselves or let's have a conversation about it. Um, it's very hard to manage time and attention, your own, other people's. You can you can feel like you're drowning. And I think one of the best things you can you can do in general is try and find you know kind of tools and channels that are facilitative of the kind of conversations, interactions you need to have, which will probably mostly be asynchronous with a little bit of kind of live support. You know, whether it's comments below videos, which are which are moderated. Uh, whether it's running a wiki, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, having some kind of discussion board, whether it's encouraging kind of mentoring and chat. I think, you know, the more you can you can think about, you know, horses for courses, there won't be a one size fits all solution. There, you're going to gradually build up the components of kind of meaningful and useful interactions and test them. That's all very exciting because once you start doing that, then, you know, there's not really an end in sight. You know, the, the learning, what you give people and what they do with that and how they reflect that back to you and each other, it all becomes part of the same sort of thing. And then you can really start making, if you like, decisions informed by data, but where the data is, you know, not just kind of measuring hits or measuring clicks or whatever, where the data is really good quality of stuff about people telling you what worked, telling you what didn't. In some ways, I much prefer this kind of what you might call softer data to what you get from a lot of LMSs, which is which is very valuable from a kind of large top down institutional point of view about how much, you know, how we are performing and delivering value for money, which is often it's not terribly useful necessarily to individual teachers. It's not it doesn't answer questions quickly and richly about good learning. It more tells you about outcomes in a general sense. So 
understanding that you can be data led in the softer senses for me and flexible is 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 very exciting for me yeah and i think um it it allows you to it frees you i think to some extent that from the constraints of a traditional timetable that you can have you have the opportunity because you have to at the moment to look afresh at what you do and the way that your programs are put together and you can apply the good practice that's well documented in the learning science and cognitive psychology research to look at your programs differently and it may have been that you've been frustrated to be in a lecture-based model for the last however many years and suddenly you're free of that you're free to think much more about what is the best way for me to work with students on these concepts on these ideas on these tasks instead of what do i fit into the one hour slot with additional seminar or tutorials so i think it's really freeing and it allows you to focus much more on your learning objectives and the outcomes for your students than the kind of organizational constraints and i understand that that's very difficult because there are still a lot of expectations i mean i have in the last four four to six weeks attended online four hour online sessions which are replacing a scheduled classroom training and because the only way that it can be replaced is like for like and i understand that that can be very difficult but at the same time there was a real opportunity there to reflect well was delivering it in this way the best thing to do anyway what could we have done or what can we do differently to enrich the experience for the students and so i think it's quite it's empowering although it's daunting at at the same time and i think also you're given permission to do look at asynchronous learning much more and to consider how to integrate it into your program i think oftentimes it feels like it's a somehow not legitimate mm. part of the program and so okay. i think sorry oh sorry i was gonna say i'm gonna jump in with a question from barbara smith here because oh. it just it ties in very nicely to this um so barbara's, barbara's asked for those who've never taught online until march into this the whole covid 19 situation what tips do you have about how to think about organizing an online class and if hybrid what do we do in class and what do we do online asynchronously yeah i mean i think i'm gonna let elspeth handle most of that oh. because <laughs> she has more expertise than me but i was just thinking that i mean the first thing is you know really where's your effort going to bring most benefit and it may well be that even though you're a superb lecturer your lecture is not is not the the thing that they need that there's a tremendous lecture out there that you can get people to watch and that what you bring is is a discussion of that lecture is is talking points is is references that you know you in a sense you can you can be bold and say well you know we're going to frame this around you know this this 10 minute lecture these five minute clips from two movies that explore these concepts in a different way and this little bit of reading and that's going to be the pre-reading if you like and what i'm going to do and what i'm going to bring is a discussion about this i'm going to you know i'm going to give you questions to think about in advance i'm going to facilitate the discussion afterwards i'm going to, I'm going to offer my reflections on it and, and the value you bring is is not is not in the thing you would have done at all it's in it's in the it's in the facilitation it, it's in the, the the programming and scheduling of the asynchronous and then the kind of prompts and framings and questions and permission to to debate around topics that you know, around materials that you didn't develop but that you've you've curated yeah and i think that um the way that i would approach if if i was working with with academics or owners of programs is to look very much at the value of your time and the value that the students gain from your time and in terms of sort of moving to online the kind of the flipped classroom model is a, is a really good place to start so taking out of your sessions the things that could easily be done by the student on their own now good mechanisms are as tom was saying maybe reading guided reading 
um, references to existing resources, you definitely don't have to build everything yourself. In fact, I think if, if there was one thing I could say now, it would be please do not think that you've got to replicate everything that you deliver in the classroom. There are great resources everywhere. And I think you can curate existing resources and build reflective tasks and group tasks around those for students and then bring them together for sessions where they present back to you, you discuss them in groups, there's peer review as well as your input and you're able to use feedback and reinforcement to really build their confidence and I think you can do that much more in an online program than you can in a classroom based program because everybody is experiencing the course more personally because it's coming into their homes they're organizing their time they're deciding how to interact with you and so I think I would be very much focused on activities that support the transfer of skills or knowledge or practice and how to structure those and then start looking at the content as a sort of mm. second as a second part of the process. Yes, I think it's interesting that in some ways there's this really this really big switch whereby you know you're, one is drowning in high quality content. It's the activities that render it meaningful. And interestingly, almost on a technical level, I'd say it's worth remembering that that not only can the asynchronous stuff be you know kind of most effectively broken down into a lot of kind of smaller options rather than great chunks of content. Uh, also, with your synchronous content, it doesn't have to be everyone in one big virtual room talking to each other or listening to you. Some of the best events I've done online in the last few months have involved, you know, kind of, as it were, kind of plenary provocations and then breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. When you when you, we get divided, which is a simple thing to do in Zoom and other platforms, into little rooms and discuss stuff and then bring them back. So synchronous absolutely doesn't have to mean everyone in the virtual room to one big lecture room. Um, any more than asynchronous has to mean everyone consuming one big virtualized lecture. Yeah, and I think it's about thinking about the level of participation of the students. So although we wouldn't necessarily like to think it's true in a lecture situation or watching an online or listening to an online lecture, it's essentially a passive activity. But you have now the opportunity to make these activities much, much more active mm. and engage the students much more than you might have been able to do if you were if you were working with large student groups and breakout rooms, polls, um, questions, pre student presentations, all these kinds of things. They also kind of shift the responsibility from the lecturer and the academic onto the students to take responsibility for their own learning more. And I think that's a really positive um, benefit for both parties, although for students it may feel like it's harder work of, of uh, making I'm, the move to online. That's great. <laughs> um, actually, can I, can I throw in one last tiny reflection? I'm sorry, I'm getting excited here. It's simply, I just think I've, I've given a lot of webinars. I'm sure Elspeth have given a lot of webinars. And just as an instructor or, you know, an alleged expert or whatever, it's, there is something very, very difficult about, if you like, talking into a silent screen for an hour. It's a very, very challenging thing to do. And it's fine if that's what you need to do. But, you know, Elspeth and I are having a dialogue now. And hopefully that's more engaging both for us and for our audience. And I actually think, you know, thinking about things like that, whether you have somebody else you can involve, whether there can be dialogue, whether, you know, just factor in, it's very hard indeed, I think, to talk well into the silence of an empty screen solo for long periods of time. And, and ways you can break this up or push it, to, push it to other formats can be really valuable for you when you're trying to create something that, you know, that you can sustainably do and that's engaging to, 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 to watch or consume. And actually, at the moment, I've seen sort of certainly in the learning science community, people just saying, do not lecture, do not mm -hmm. lecture online, just, you know, steer, steer clear, which is really interesting, because if you look at how the MOOCs um, developed, it's all around that model. But I think at the moment, the idea that you've somehow got to start recording or giving live one, two, three hour lectures is a very is not the right place to start. It's about dialogue and feedback 
and communication with your students. This is brilliant, brilliant. I think I'm actually going to delve into, we've had some really great questions coming in through the audience. And as we're now sort of discussing how to keep your teaching interactive, um, I'm going to ask you both a couple of the questions that have come in um, and lead with not a question, but a great statement from Richard saying, learning is not an observer sport. Who said that? <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so we've got a, a question here from Gabia saying, do you have any tips of how to create a safe environment for intimate discussions online containing students' personal experiences? Goodness. So um, <laughs> I have had some um, quite recent experience of this, actually, um, in terms of looking at um, things like harassment and abuse and, and ways to talk about that. I think um, it, there are lots of challenges with doing that online, um, not least because of the ability to record and um, sort of keep copies of dialogue and discussions. So I think it's quite important to think about the whole area of anonymity and how you can design activities where students can retain their anonymity whilst also being able to share. Um, and there are lots of lots of tools available that allow you to do that. There are interactive whiteboards and there are breakout rooms. There are you can use conference facilities with anonymous logins, etc. But I would say that the anonymity is the key difficulty I think and and helping and reassuring students that they are free to speak openly and with confidence and I think that it's also important in terms of design to look at whether you want to do one-on-one -on -one or small groups or larger groups for those sorts of activities. Yeah I mean it's a really it's a really big and important question and I think you know, as a general rule, uh, having a great deal of clarity, both about kind of codes of conduct and expectations, and being very clear in advance what is and isn't, you know, going to be covered by a particular kind of conversation. Because fundamentally, what you want to avoid is things being said in in an inappropriate setting for those, which are not safe, safe for the person, safe in terms of data. Uh, safe in terms of you know recording and so on and so to be you know really crystal clear about a baseline code of conduct uh, with I think you know zero tolerance for breaches of just all discussions of, of civility and there's plenty of examples out there but then also being really clear that when you're going to have a discussion that might touch on areas that are you know triggering for some people or uh, that, that involve highly personal you know self-revelations and others that that that's been that's known in advance, that's set out, and then an appropriate technical infrastructure, as it were, an appropriate mode is adopted for that. And I suppose I would hope, although these things are very difficult, that as long as one is very clear in advance about you know what is going to be entailed, so people aren't caught by it, so that there isn't something that occurs in an inappropriate context, you can then pick the right technologies that may offer anonymity that may be one-to-one, -one, that may, as far as these things are possible, try to kind of bar recording or indicate recording, although in general, it's always possible to record something. And you should remember that. Anybody can, no matter what the app, anyone can hold up a phone and, and video or record audio off a screen. You know, there's no, there is no technology that can stop someone recording something. So ultimately, some stuff may simply need not to be done online at all. Um, but I, I think having those, clarity initially and indicating to everybody what what is and isn't going to be covered because what you want to avoid I guess is is the contextual problem where things come up um, that are handled badly that people weren't expecting that, that catch them off guard where they feel that they weren't warned or they feel that they said something and and the technical setup wasn't there to to protect or safeguard them I think also just to add into that, um, it's more of a general um, point about how to manage online activity, particularly live sessions like this, is it's very, very difficult to manage them and be the facilitator at the same time. And I think it's a particular challenge 
for people who are trying to take their academic programs online that there very is very often isn't an additional person there to support um, and I think it's it's in particular circumstances where you're dealing with lots of feedback where you want to have breakout rooms where there may be complex or difficult activities that you should have additional support available technical yeah. support and also facil facilitation support and this is a huge problem for tech in general. You know, moderation is just, yeah. you know, you look at social media and so on. It's it's arguably one of the biggest uh, and most toxic challenges that they face. There aren't easy answers. There certainly aren't algorithmic answers. And thus, I think also part of dealing with this sort of thing, and, and this is institutional as much as anything else, is having recourses, if you sort of mean, is having procedures in place so that if people feel things have gone wrong, because as with cybersecurity, you know, you, you have to work on the basis that sometimes, despite your best efforts, things will happen that you didn't want to happen. The question is then, are is there clarity about redress, about investigation, about accountability, about what people do? Because what you don't want, you know, is, is, is something to happen and someone to feel that there are no good, formal, agreed upon routes for exploring it, addressing it, trying trying to deal with what came out of it and so on and so on. And that's an institutional challenge. And I think a lot of institutions, um, I would hope, are thinking very hard about what they put in place more generally about the safety and the and the welfare and, and the security and so on of anybody doing um, online services and you know as 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 part of their membership of that institution. We've had some great follow-on questions on this topic, actually, on sort of this anonymity, uh, what to do for personal discussions. Um, and just for the matter of time, what I might do is collect these questions and what we'll do in the follow-up, uh, the week, the one week follow-up, when we send an email, if Tom and Elsbeth could get, we can get some written answers from you on that. Sure. Um, just, for, just for the sake of time, I'm a bit wary. We, we don't have too long left. And we have a lot more questions coming in. Um, I'm going to ask one more question that's, that's a little bit still on the interactivity side um, from Adrian saying uh, that he thinks one of the one-to-one -one tutorials are going to be key. Personally, I've always had a better relationships equals better outcomes philosophy. I think the challenge comes into how to build and develop and maintain these relationships online. Any thoughts? I mean, it's a tremendous gift to be able to have you know, kind of one-to-one -one conversations with people sort of anywhere, anyhow. And I think one of the difficulties of this can be, you know, knowing how to how to make it work while not overstretching yourself, while not while not simply taking up too much time and while not making yourself too available. And I think I do mentoring online as, a, as, a, as, a, as an author, which is a different kind of thing. But I find that being very clear about you have to put in a lot more work, I think, in terms of framing what it is you want to give people, uh, what it is you're hoping to offer, why you think you're doing it and so on. It, all of the stuff that is unsaid often needs to be said, I find, if you want to help people. But the advantage of that is that I think a well-run session, if you like, can give people quite a lot quite fast. You can, you can again, as often in online situations, do quite a lot of on asynchronous prep that makes the synchronous mm -hmm. moment really valuable. And so I think for me that the main tip in terms of, because ultimately if you're, you know, if, if this is what you do and if this is a, a big part of your pedagogy, you're it's probably something you're very good at that, that, you, that you naturally, uh, you know, give people a lot through. But the question is the time, the attention, the management. And so I would say, well, how much asynchronous work can go into setting expectations, exchanging some ideas, establishing what someone's going to get out of it, what someone wants, what, what, what they most need. In coaching, one uses a GROW model of setting out goals and looking at kind of actions and so on. That's not, I'm sure, appropriate directly for academia, and I don't use that as a teacher. But I think that sort of coaching facilitative mindset is quite useful when you're ultimately you're saying, OK, I just want a really maybe a really high quality 10 or 15 minutes with someone um, can give them a tremendous amount if we've done the work beforehand. But if we haven't kind of done, done the work beforehand and established what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, what we want to get out of it, uh, then it can sort of flounder because of the lack of the uh, of, of the co-presence. Yeah, I would agree. And I think it's important to look carefully at what those sessions, what, what you are aiming to achieve with those sessions. Um, and it may be that there are different requirements from those sessions when it's part of a 
distance or an online program than there were when it was part of a an in-person program. Um, so I think it's really important, as Tom was saying, to be very clear about the boundaries, about the timing and about the goals for those individual interactions. But I think it's also about exploring ways of continuing to have one-to-one -one relationships with students, but also looking at other possibilities around giving students peer support groups, setting group work, and allowing for peer review to set up additional support networks rather than just the, that mm. specific student tutor interaction. Um, and I think when we were we, when we're talking generally about how to make your programs interactive, and we talked earlier about not starting with content, I think engagement is the best place to start in terms of social engagement collaborative engagement, cognitive engagement, obviously, with the content and the topics and the learning objectives, but those other pieces that fit around and their emotional engagement with each other, with, with you and with the topic. And I think if you look at the how to maintain engagement, interactivity falls from that because by looking at all of the different ways to engage with your students and to engage them with the content and with each other, kind of out of that comes an interactive program because yeah. you will have designed time-spaced activities with space for reflection and for collaboration. You will have cut down the length of content delivery from an hour to 15 or 20 minutes, you will have provided opportunities for self-assessment and for personal research. So because if you're thinking about engagement and how to keep people occupied and engaged with the program, it, it kind of helps you come up with a structure that benefits the, the students in terms of transfer. Mm. Yeah, and, um, and oh, sorry, I just Karen. no. Sorry, I always have one more thought. <laughs> I, just, I mean, I'm really just taking what Elspeth said, but I think if you're having, you know, if you have a history of, of really great one-to-one -one interactions with people, it can just be really useful to be, you know, to tap into your own expertise and say, you know, here here are the things that I really feel that that students get out of these interactions. This is what they're gaining. You know, perhaps what I'm gaining as well. And replicating those gains online and through blended experiences is not going to be a question of transferring the same one-to-one -one interaction. Yeah. It might be, as Elspeth said, that, that what they get, you know, is a sense of of being heard. What that what they get is partly a sense of have been given permission to talk about what they're worried about, and that some of that can be granted through quite different uh, mechanisms online. But the point is the experiences that you're trying to enable and your your expertise and your knowledge of what it is that you give people through the best of your skills and then how those can be kind of re-envisaged maybe completely re-envisaged online to impart the same thing in such a different context brilliant okay so i'm going to just before i jump to the next question um speaking about interactivity we're going to run our last poll um for everyone and this is to try to get a confidence barometer of the room of how confident people are feeling in their online learning so i'm just going to run this before we jump to the next so can everybody see the poll yep that's responses are coming in great we'll give you a minute or so to answer this um because the next questions we're sort of covering are on are on tips about teaching, uh, things to sort of make you feel a bit more confident in that. And Elsbeth and Tom, if it's all right with you, I might jump straight to question five, just for a matter of timing. So we've had a lot of great questions yeah. coming too. Yeah, okay, we'll give everyone a, a minute longer. Uh, as of yet, the results are the results are quite promising. We've got somewhat confident <laughs> is the majority. That that's that's nice to hear. Mm. That hasn't always been the case. I've been on other webinars where people have said, <laughs> have said the opposite, so we're off to a strong start. We wouldn't want too much confidence. <laughs> oh, of course. Okay, I think most people have voted now. I'm going to close that. Great. And then we're going to just jump into our last structured question of the day, and then I will 
I will run um, through some more questions that came in from the audience. But the question being, what should we be thinking about the difference in time required for blending learning compared to in person? Okay, could I start on that one if yeah. that's all right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's an interesting question because I would look at it in, in two ways. I'd like to know whose time are we talking about? Um, is it the student's time or is it the teacher's time? Because I think that as we discussed earlier, there is a lot of responsibility for learning and engagement has shifted from the teacher onto the student. And I think in general, students need to make more time for engagement in blended learning than they do for engagement in in-person. Because at the most base level for in-person, they, they show up at a time and they are they are participating in the activity and then they leave but they are committed and as tom was saying right at the beginning all those other distractions are managed for them whereas for blended learning particularly at the moment where people are uh, trying to live other lives around the learning potentially it's taking a lot more of their time um, given also that the design of programs is moving much more to smaller chunks, more self-assessment, more reflection, group tasks, more student-generated content, I think students are finding that they are working harder than before. I'm not sure that that's necessarily because they're putting more effort in or just because there are more challenges around time management. But I also think that the teacher is having to spend a lot more time in preparation and design activities. Because for something, as Tom was saying, you can't just do a one hour live session without preparation if you want to hold your audience. So I think no, it's... Just... Sorry, Sorry. I've... noises of agreement. <laughs> <I was> just... <laughs> just... It is, it's very interesting to me, I mean, that last what you're saying you can't just do a one hour session and it's if you're a you know if you're a good teacher dealing with a topic you know very well to some degree if you've done a lot of teaching in this area before you can almost walk into a room and give people a great one hour you can respond to them you know they, you can all have a tremendous highly focused hours experience and there doesn't necessarily need to be that much preparation if it's an area that you know very intimately and you've mm -hmm. taught a lot and i think the amount of labor you have to do online to reproduce that sort of the, all those kind of framing and contextual effects. So I'm sure all of us have heard about Zoom fatigue. You know this 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 you know perhaps non-existent, but I think you know so a lot of people feel it to be very real. I certainly do. It's exhausting to spend a day doing calls through your screen. Now, there's many reasons for this. You're, you're sitting down and it's undifferentiated. But I think also. There's immense emotional labor required to sort of inject the proceedings with meaning and memorability and so on. It's a much bigger ask of you. There's because for all the reasons Elspeth said, and I think this puts a huge onus as far as possible on you know us as teachers or instructors or or, or any any sort of form of knowledge, not knowledge people who who give knowledge to people or seek to inform them, to be very respectful of people's time. And to be very careful not to not to abuse it, not to, for example, record almost a stream of consciousness introductory video that lasts 15 minutes long, uh, that lasts 15 minutes, and to expect them to watch 15 minutes of linear video to get our introduction to a topic or course when we could have recorded with a little bit more effort 90 seconds of video plus three bullet points, yeah. or. I think you know, video in particular can be very wasteful of people's time. It can be very disrespectful towards people's time. And in some ways, the informal norms of social media and day-to-day -day digital usage are a very good guide to how people try to manage their time and attention in an information environment. Yeah. You know, you the, the, the deep dive in something is, is quite rare. You set aside a bit of time to read a long read, you know, to, to really go into something, but that's quite rare. Often what you want is a synopsis, is bullet points, is a short message, is a kind of headline, is, is a sort of 90 second voicemail, so to speak. And actually, there's no reason not to make full use of that gamut of possibilities. Um, 
and it does ask more of the instructor. But you know, people are really laboring emotionally to carve out attention, you know, to, to differentiate and working with them, ultimately all working together to try to make memorable experiences, to try and kind of turn, you know, turn information into meaning. And, and the social side is absolutely crucial. And I think really, you know, absolutely reinforcing everything Elspeth was saying, really, you know, to turn something from I'm trying to get knowledge into your head by videoing it or typing it out to I wish you to learn about this. And I'm providing prompts and materials for you and a bunch of other people to talk about it, to come back to me, tell me what you didn't get for me to produce a short response to that, for us to have a session where we have a little plenary moment and some breakouts. I then I offer some feedback. Mm -hmm. And to be innovative about content in the sense of being prepared to produce audio only content, you know, just don't, don't do everything on video by default. A few short videos, you know, a few links to other people's work, some commentaries. The more variation you can introduce, the more you're potentially giving people the tools to make sense of this information within their own life situation, because everyone will be in a different situation. Uh, you know, they can't all just sit down and consume the content. And to some degree, the more flexibility and options you give them, the more likely they are to, you know, to find to find a kind of pattern that works for them in the time that they have. I think, I think course, great... sorry, oh, sorry, could I just, of just course wanted that... to say one thing, sorry. I think that one of the reasons that sort of, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence at the moment that people are spending a huge amount of time putting their online courses together. And one of the reasons for that is that they are working really hard to replicate their existing program um, because there hasn't been time to think about doing things differently. And I think that you need to almost reflect on your value, the value of the time that your students are spending engaging with you and what they would seek to get from it. And I think our earlier question about maintaining the integrity of these one-to-one -one sessions and the benefit of those sessions is critical, that the students are looking for you to be a mentor and to provide insights. You don't need to create and provide content. Content is available and it's your spin, it's your way of looking at it, it's your insights, it's peer review and reflection and learning together, which is the best way to support them in learning and for you to improve your program. So I think that, yes, a lot of time is being spent on creating blended learning. And I'm sh I think quite a lot of that time is being spent trying to replicate things that happen in the classroom, which probably don't need to happen, that you could just go back to looking at things differently and how best to help your students meet the learning goals. I've got a great following question sort of about that um, from Mitchell saying this summer I've taught three online courses undergraduate and graduate planning plenty of learning exercises for students has not been difficult he does however wonder about the class what about the classroom experience is missing so what do you identify as the most important elements of the classroom I know we've just spoken a lot about you don't have to replicate everything but what are the important elements of the classroom that to include in that online instruction well from my experience particularly I do a lot of work with professional and workplace learning it's the social interaction mm. that the students are really missing being with each other and I think that that comes through at you know school level as well so in a way it's not the learning experience it's the group participation, it's the collegiate feel, it's the collaboration and the social sharing, I think is particularly challenging when people are distanced at the moment. And I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think institutionally and organisationally, a lot more support could be given um, to giving students more robust platforms for social interaction. Um, but I, I would say that that's the biggest piece that's difficult to add into the online programs. Yeah, and I think absolutely. And it's it's the fact that this is the casual and the informal social. So it's it's not it's not the the kind of formal let's get together and talk about, you know, an issue in a group. 
this is the coming into and out of the classroom, like walking into and out of a conference yeah. or standing at the bar and, and chatting to someone. And I think that's very hard to replicate online because it, it acts as a kind of safety valve for a lot of people. They can seek kind of reassurance and solidarity. It's, you know, it, it's often almost nonverbal. It's just, just being part of it. And, you know, how do people reproduce things like that online? You know, I mean, areas like Instagram and so on are often where people, uh, you know, do casual, casual belonging. I'm not suggesting you migrate stuff to Instagram, but I think it's very interesting to ask, well, you know, what are workplaces doing? You know, they're often having things like Friday night drinks, they're having things like quizzes, they're having informal activities. And, and the point of an informal activity like a quiz or whatever is that it acts as a context around the edges of which informal um, social stuff can take place. So you have a point that is not, we're going to have a discussion. The point is we're going to do something else. And I'm very interested in everyone's limited time as to what kind of quote unquote kind of fun or activities you can do that, that give people permission uh, and maybe asynchronously, you know, there's a, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of puzzly game-like or even sort of work related, but not directly on topic projects that people can do, you know, building a wiki, building a resource and so on, which just have these opportunities for this kind of casual solidarity and, and the sort of safety valves and reassurances that come with that. And I agree that, you know, institutions, uh, you know, could, could do a lot more, I think, to think about this systematically, but, but it needs to be led by what people actually find useful, um, what people actually uh, will, will, will do. And sometimes also there's very simple things. So I have friends who spend their whole day Zooming, who like to hang around at the end of Zoom calls and see who else is hanging around. So you can quote unquote, bump into people, which might sound a bit sad, but I think you're know, giving people permission to, to come in five minutes early. We're starting at three, drop in from, from quarter to three, if you want, we'll just be chatting. You know, it finishes at 3.30, but I'll be on the call for another 15 minutes if anyone wants wants to you know ask something not something confidential because that's not appropriate for a, for a confidential or private discussion but something kind of in, informal people might you know building a bit of informality around the edges of an experience can can bring i think tremendous dividends actually i think that's sort of the idea of drop in sessions as well mm -hmm. where there are completely open sessions where you can just pop in and ask questions or meet people and also um back channels as well and having back channels operating as well as the more formal discussion forums or um, other activities using things like slack um, or yammer or whatever is used at your institution um, to allow people to communicate at course or curriculum level without necessarily moving on to the purely social platforms um, because i think there's also a challenge in terms of not mixing um mm. your kind of professional life with your personal life it was interesting to, when when we were working on critical thinking that that was some of the feedback that came from the students about which equipment they used for learning and they had work machines and then they had personal machines yeah so i think it's quite it's it, you need to be respectful of that as well i think it's and actually just thinking about sometimes it can be quite powerful just to think about people's physical situations um just to realize that uh, that maybe people need a little bit of help a little bit of mentoring with with having you know a kind of a work mode or zone they can transition to that these boundaries are really helpful and often it's the lack of these boundaries that, that people are struggling with when they're struggling with time it's just an aside <laughs> This has been a really great discussion. We only have a couple of minutes left, and I know I could. This is this, this. There's so much to cover. We could go on for ages. Um, but I just want to say thank you, everyone, who's put in their questions. We haven't had a chance to answer all of them. We've got through quite a, quite a fair few, but not all on the call today. But what we will do is we're taking a log of these questions, and when we send the follow-up and the recording of the, of the webinar in one week, we will have Tom and Elspeth would have answered a couple of them um, in by text for us as well so you will receive those as well with a, um, as a link to the next webinar in the series and some resources that have been requested um, so Tom and Elsbeth I just want to answer now one minute that we have left uh, what would be the one key point both that you would have from the discussion today that you'd want people to take away um, shall I go first um, yeah yeah we're on the clock <laughs> I'll go first I mean <laughs> don't try and be right in advance about everything don't try and you know just kind of design the, the perfect lecture and feel that's your job and feel that you've got to you know work 
all hours until you've created the perfect content. Embrace iteration and uncertainty and other people's content and just keep asking, you know, what's working, what isn't, how can we all do this a little bit more effectively together? Yeah, and I think I would, mine would be very similar. It's be, just be kind to yourself and, you know, acknowledge what you can and you can't achieve in the med in the short term and put together a, an achievable plan. So recognize that you're on a journey from reacting to a situation to improvement and then to having a sustainable solution and just recognize that you're learning and give yourself space and time to do that. Um, I, I don't I don't see any benefit in putting yourself trying to meet a standard that you can't actually quantify because your remote learning or your online learning is never going to be exactly the same as what you do in the classroom. So you need to let go of that and just look at things for afresh. And just one other thing, get some professional support if you can <laughs> at all. Um, I know it's something that's not really available um, to many people, but there are lots and there is lots of research and there are lots of really helpful learning science, instructional design, blogs out there with some really good helpful practical tips about technology and approaches brilliant well thank you very much someone else this was a great session thank and thanks everyone for attending and we will send a follow-up one week from today so next thursday <laughs> bye bye everybody thank you bye bye bye